In the fourth edition of Dungeons and Dragons, the Astral Expanse was explored in The Plane Above, Secrets of the Astral Sea, a resource that becomes once again very topical and handy when exploring 5th edition's return to off-world adventures in Spelljammer. One of my favourite and very interesting races found in that book are known as the Quam, and today we're going to learn all about them. So grab yourself a tasty beverage, put your mental feet up on the comfortable recliner of your imagination, we're about to get deeply nerdy. The Quam are a mortal race of humanoids that are native to the Astral Sea but travel freely all across the multiverse. They are widely feared by many for their sudden and violent encounters, and their strange fanatical obsession with collecting a mysterious substance that can be contained in powerful magical relics and even inside living beings, the extraction of which often leads to destruction and death. But the full story of the Quam is a tale of terrible tragedy, great injustice, and one of secret shame for none other than the platinum dragon god, Bahamut. Back when the astral plane was first created through the disastrous attempt by a race called the Spellweavers to all ascend to godhood at the same time, a subject of a future video that is sure to change the way you think about the various iterations of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse, this realm of imagination made manifest spawned countless parallel planes, now referred to as the upper or lower planes, or the outer or inner planes of existence, the realms that in turn spawned who knows how many new gods in the outer planes and new primordial powers in the inner planes. The Spellweavers, or those very few who survived their cataclysm, now considered their reality shattered and entered the era they called the Scrambling, desperately seeking some way to reverse what they did and restore from their perspective the original and correct state of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. Largely ignorant of this, the gods and primordials inevitably came into direct conflict with each other. The primordials were supreme engines of wanton creation and destruction, thriving on the power and chaos of elemental forces on the prime material plane while the gods sought to preserve and protect the law and order of reality, because they were reliant on the belief of living beings within that prime material plane to provide them with their divine power and maintain their existence. The actions of the primordials were very often extremely hostile to mortal life, but mostly the gods just fought the primordials out of a more selfish motivation of protecting themselves. In one such epic battle, Toward the end of these years of the great conflict between the forces of law and chaos, the powerful primordial being of pure nothingness named Nihil engaged in an epic final battle with the god Bahamut, paragon of law and order. They pitched their forces against each other across multiple planes of existence and eventually they met in battle in person. Unfortunately, neither side exactly picked where this battle was to take place and by sheer chance, they had crashed through the planet barriers and ended up plummeting through the cool green mists and into the living plane of Lakal, home and creator goddess of the Quam. Now up until this point, the Quam were one of the most highly regarded races of pure benevolence and goodness in the multiverse. You see, they ventured out of the living paradise of Lakal with no other intention than to be of the most service and benefit to all other goodly forms of life. If an individual Quam achieved significant and meaningful acts of supreme kindness and mercy and support of others, they were rewarded with a one-on-one -on -one personal communication with Lakal herself. And so they were incredibly dedicated. When Bahamut and Nihil smashed into Lakal, there were a great number of them away on missions of support, diplomacy and healing on the very front lines of the raging cosmic battle, having worked tirelessly as best they could to try and prevent the outbreak of war between the primordials and the gods. They instead did their best to help all other races simply survive. And then, in the climax of the battle, Bahamut unleashed his full and devastating power of destruction, his miles-long breath weapon beam of disintegration, destroying Nihil, shattering its body and causing shards of its deceased non-being to permeate the pure body of Lakal. On that day, Lakal died a most horrific and gruesome death, and the living realm exploded into a thousand comets and countless smaller particles. Everyone present in the realm died instantly, of course, and across the astral sea, the only qualm left were the thousands that had spread out through the silvery expanse and realms contained therein to tend to the wounded. To say that they keenly felt the death of Lakal is quite an understatement. The loss was profound beyond words. Their mother, their home, their reason for existing was screaming into their very souls and then suddenly she was gone. Like their very souls had been torn from their bodies, leaving them empty and worthless husks. Everywhere the wandering Quam could be found, they were incredibly traumatized and raced for their home as fast as they possibly could, when they could manage to do anything at all beyond scream and sob uncontrollably. The devastation they found when they arrived was absolute, and worse still, Lakal had died for nothing. 
In fact, there's a theory that her death may have shattered the boundary between the prime material plane and the far realm, or at least many sages speculate this to be a major factor. To quote directly from the source material, as Lakal's dying shrieks reverberated in their heads, the surviving Quam chose as one to set aside the ways of peace. From that day forward, they vowed to heal only their own. With unyielding determination, they sought to revive Lakal by tracking down and reassembling her sundered parts, slaying anyone who stood in their path without mercy or moral purpose, just as their families and their deity had been slain. If these victims were innocent bystanders in a greater struggle, so be it. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time, just as Lakal had been. The Quam call their project to reassemble all the parts of Lakal the Unsundering. They worked ceaselessly to gather up every fragment of Lakal, no matter how small. The largest parts were long ago discovered. Now, the Quam Comet Hunters, as they're called, track down tiny shards. When a hunter is within 15 feet of one, he or she is capable of perceiving a speck of Lakal as tiny as a pinpoint. The Unsundering puts the Quam in conflict with all other inhabitants of the Astral Sea. Many of the tiny motes of Lakal that the Quam now hunt have long since integrated themselves with other objects and they're often found in magical items that have been scattered through the known realms over the years. It is entirely possible that a magic ring purchased in Sigil, or found in a mortal world dungeon, contains a long lost speck of Lakal matter. Lakal matter also functions as a nutrient, and such it can be found in edible plants and the bodies of living animals. Many creatures have infinitesimal bits of Lakal embedded in their bodies, although a small incision might be sufficient to remove a moat of Lakal matter lodged in the skin or a surface muscle, a spot in one's lungs or heart requires an extraction that proves fatal to the patient. The Quam perform these murderous surgeries without hesitation. One or more characters or their equipment might be targeted by the Quam. The Quam have enough experience with adventurers to realize that few such individuals allow one member of their band to be singled out and destroyed, so an adventuring party that has one member targeted by the Quam is likely to be attacked en masse. Even if they aren't being targeted at a given time, characters need to be on their guard around the Quam. One peaceful encounter with a Quam does not guarantee that a future encounter will not lead to violence, since in the intervening time one or more characters might unknowingly ingest motes of Lakal. Fragments of Lakal large enough to be seen look like softly glowing crystals. When Quam comet hunters find new motes, they press them against the hull of their comet ships, growing each ship one tiny piece at a time. On the day when all of the pieces are finally gathered, the ships will set on a collision course with one another, and Lakal, the realm and the deity, will be reborn. Some say that before Lakal can be fully reconstructed, Bahamut will have to die to atone for his unthinking role in her doom. Originally a caste-based society of healers, diplomats, scholars and explorers, due to the cataclysmic death of Lakal, most of the Quam not present in Lakal at the time of the cataclysm were the diplomats with their light turquoise skin and the healers who have a violet skin tone, now comprising most of the Quam alive today. But there are others, and anyway, the colour of a Quam skin these days means very little. They are a merit-based culture. Only individual accomplishments matter. One's family history or current relatives mean next to nothing to them. Quam have a distinctive appearance. They are thick, broad-shouldered and burly like a dwarf, but are the same height as a human and have almost no body hair at all. Symmetry is extremely important to them in almost every aspect of their culture. They never have any skin blemishes and their features are exactly mirrored. One side of their body to the other are identical. So strong is this desire for symmetry that it's not just considered ugly, but actually a shocking social taboo to appear in public with something like a scar, like on one side of the face, or be missing a hand. They will either conceal or seclude themselves until this can be totally restored through ritual magic, or they can go to the extreme of scarring the other side of the body to exactly match their other scar. Their language is also strangely symmetrical and balanced. Most of their words and almost all of their names are palindromes. A palindrome is a word, phrase or sentence that reads the same backward or forward, such as radar, civic and so on. To the Quam, other races are generally lopsided and unpleasant in appearance. As you can imagine, this was a reflection of the physical being of Lakal, a paradise of golden ratios, mirror-like reflections and geometric structures while at the same time being a verdant, always warm, always illuminated landscape of incredible grace and beauty, literally glowing with divine living energy and an ecosystem in perfect harmony. Like a great self-contained Dyson sphere, the Quam lived within Lakal, with gem-like moons orbiting around within the radiant essence of Lakal's divine spirit, burning brightly as a star. 
Now Qualm live almost exclusively on board astral ships constructed from gathered materials and powered by chunks of Lakal. On the endless quest, they do occasionally need to refuel the ship by the sacrifice of life force. Other life forms can be used, but the best results are achieved when Qualm give up their own lives to power their home ship and merge their essence with Lakal once again. As you can imagine, the sizes and variety of the comet ships are staggering. Some of their vessels are more than equal to the Rock of Brawl and can be found in the thousands docked up around the moon-sized large chunks of Lakal that are densely occupied by Quam, busy devoting time and resources constantly to the search for new more fragments. Social advancement and reputation for the Quam is all about their success in gathering more fragments of Lakal. On board their ships, the Quam raise crops and simple small livestock that are easy to manage. And they're also known to produce and sell the finest metalwork and ceramic containers which fetch premium prices everywhere they are found. Quam ships are their mobile homes. Each is a population, not a crew, but a community. They are quite independent and there is nothing that really passes for a central authority in Quam culture. So a Quam vessel may identify itself with the symbol of a type of industry, a particular animal or structure, an aspect of Lakao that has nothing to do with the culture on board that ship. A plow doesn't indicate that Quam are better at farming than any other Quam. Remember, the vast majority of Quam who would have been farmers, architects, lumberjacks and so on were all wiped out along with their knowledge and culture when Lakal exploded. The largest chunks and fragments of Lakal have long since been found by the Quam, but they will not stop until finally, one day, one of them will be the mythical figure who finds and collects the very last piece of their home plane and their goddess. Every Quam believes this figure is them and they are very close to the completion of the eons long quest. Each generation of Quam has believed this also, but who knows how long it will take and if it really is even possible. Still, there is no other option in the minds of the Quam. Lakal must be restored. Quam ships range across the entire astral sea and often seem to be erratic in their flight paths, but they are simply avoiding areas where no Lakal fragments are found and heading to traditionally richer hunting grounds particularly anywhere that sees a lot of travellers from beyond the Astral Sea, and at any time you might fly through a distinctive kind of ship graveyard, the vessels lifeless and seemingly torn to bits thanks to the Quam's destructive search methods. Another fascinating feature of this species are the Darud. A Quam of great achievement undergoes a bizarre physical transformation. Over a period of weeks, the back of its skull begins to reconfigure itself. A brow ridge appears, then eye sockets, and finally a set of functioning eyes. Eventually, the Quam gains an entire second face on the back of its head, identical to the first. In game terms, this change occurs when a Quam advances to a more epic tier of experience. From this point on, the Quam is capable of sensing the presence of one of Lakal's moats within 40 feet of itself, compared to 15 feet for an ordinary Quam comet hunter. Quam that have second faces are known as the Darud. This means leader or hero, wise one and priest all at once. When a Quam becomes old and infirm, its second face fades and is reabsorbed. It loses its Darud status and enters a state of feeble-minded dotage. This change rarely occurs since most Darud die in combat or in self-sacrifice long before old age can creep up on them. Males and females regard one another as equals, although Darud are more important than anyone else. Beyond their special enmity for Bahamut, the Quam believe that all gods and primordials share responsibility for the death of Lakal. They say that divine balance between law and chaos and good and evil is merely a story each side tells about itself. Morality died when Lakal was slain. When she is restored, perhaps a new accord can be struck with those deities, willing to bow down before her and make gestures of contrition. In the meantime, the gods and their followers deserve nothing but scorn. Clerics and other divine servants are treated as dupes and charlatans. And although their goddess is dead, the Quam can still wield divine power, which they derive from the energy surrounding their ships. And it is this outpouring of her divine power that rockets their ships through the astral realms. Although some small specialist Quam raiding craft can fly in a planet's atmosphere and land or take off using vertical takeoff and landing jets. The divine rocket flames are very destructive to anything caught in them, and in combat with other ships or structures, the Quam simply maneuver to catch their enemies within the flames, immolating ships, structures, and people with intense fires. Some ships also concentrate and focus this fire in the form of flame lances that are aimed and fired at other vessels much like Greek fire pumps, but with much greater range and accuracy. However, the Quam are there to collect fragments of Lakal, so they employ grapples and harpoons of all shapes and sizes, and are particularly good at close quarters skirmish fighting, with a lot of skill in grappling and incapacitating their targets. They use paralytic poisons and many spells that achieve the same result. 
an unresisting victim who they can then perform a fragment extraction on is the ideal. Thanks to eons of encounters with the Quam, the Githyanki have developed a magical means to detect fragments of Lakal, but only within very close range. So typically when they suspect an encounter with the Quam is imminent, they will use this method to go over their whole ship and any living beings on board, eliminating any fragments they find before the Quam do it forcibly for them. And that's about all I have for you for the Quam at the moment, a very interesting species with a unique worldview and tragic yet terrible motivation that drives them to become villains in the eyes of all others. The Astral Expanse is just loaded with unique cultures and such epic tales. Stick with my channel and slowly but surely, we will populate it with lore from every edition of the game and beyond. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.